So unfortunately, at our institution, stent grafts are now put in by the vascular surgeons. Even though, you know, I mean, all of the initial work, the pioneering work, at least at our institution, was done by Bob Rosen, a, a vascular radiologist. And the truth is because the vascular surgeons have very little to do if they're not doing that, because at our place about 70% of aortic aneurysms are treated by endovascular repair as opposed to open repair. For this uh, lecture, I'm going to talk a little bit about the epidemiology of aortic aneurysms, some of the techniques that we use to evaluate them, and particularly the imaging evaluation, the things that you, look to, that you need to look for before and after a stent graft placement. Here we see a rather large 80 millimeter aneurysm, I think, it's time for this guy to have something done on his particular aneurysm. The U.S. Preventive Services Task Force, you know, we talk about screening a lot um, and imaging, that is the lung, the colon, breast, but they recently put in a recommendation that a one-time ultrasonographic screening of abdominal aortic aneurysms be performed in men between the ages of 65 and 75 who have or have ever smoked. And it's thought that that segment of the population uh, would have 360,000 360, aneurysms defined by an aorta over three centimeters. And then what you do with those, you would just, you know, follow them until they got to a certain size. It's interesting because we got a, a, an edict from our VA that, you know, in every CT scan that we do, we need to put into the report, there is no aneurysm present. And I had no idea why I was being asked to do that until I read this and realized that the VA was actually screening now for abdominal uh, aortic aneurysms. And it's a lot of work to do ultrasounds on all these people, and so if they're having a CT as anyway, might as well just eliminate the ultrasound in that particular patient population. It's very rare, I think, to see an aneurysm come into your practice this large, right? 91 millimeters. Has anybody seen one of these? So I, I guess maybe it's not as rare, but... I think it's the largest one I ever saw, and it was back in October 27, 2004. And I remember calling up the vascular surgeon and saying, you know, this is a big aneurysm. They're like, I oh, don't worry, we have him on the schedule for two weeks from now. All right, guy came into our ER a couple of days later, one week later, in fact, with abdominal pain. And you see that there is now blood leaking out of the side of this aneurysm. This is a ruptured aneurysm. The only reason why this guy is alive, by the way, is that this rupture is kind of in the retroperitoneum. If you have a ventral rupture, the patients die. They'll never make it in because they'll just exsanguinate out into the peritoneal cavity. Um, an aneurysm like this allows the blood to track and get stuck in that uh, contained. So occasionally those patients will survive. The patient was taken immediately to uh, uh, surgery, and they actually put an endovascular stent in this person uh, to fix this aneurysm. Regarding the risk of rupture is directly related to the aneurysm size, and you can see this listed here, you know, small aneurysms that is less than four, five centimeters almost never rupture. As they get larger, the risk of rupture per year increases such that an aneurysm between five and six millimeters, well, it's, it's about five percent per year. Obviously, there are things that increase, you know, if you have a rapid expansion, smokers and patients with hypertension have increased risk of, of rupturing and increased risk of having aneurysms in general. But ruptured aortic aneurysms account for about 9,000 deaths in this country per year and about 30,000 elective repairs are performed. And interestingly, when I was looking at this data, 30,000 elective repairs, 2,000 patients die in the 30-day perioperative mortality as a result of open repair of aneurysm. Seems to me like a very high rate of death from a procedure that, you know, is not necessarily going to kill you, depending on how big that aneurysm is. The question then is, when should intervention be performed? And traditionally, five centimeters has been used as the size when patients are considered to have surgery. You have a five centimeter aneurysm. However, there was a study in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2002 that survival was not improved if you observed patients or if you operated on them for aneurysms less than five and a half centimeters. So as a result of this, our surgeons generally do not operate or consider operation unless the aneurysm has gotten over five and a half centimeters. And it's based on this report of over a thousand patients who were randomized into surveillance versus open repair. 
You know, but we do see these, these ruptures, and again, this is a patient, it's very rare to see these ruptures, and the only time you'll ever see them is when they rupture into the retroperitoneum. You can see all the blood around this, and somebody was asking me, I gave a lecture on the retroperitoneal spaces, how does a ruptured aneurysm cause a gray Turner sign? Well, the blood cracks around here into the posterior pararenal space and can get out through these anatomic points of weakness onto the left side. This only happens, again, with contained retroperitoneal ruptures. Again, this patient's taken right to the operating room, 78 millimeter aneurysm. In 1991, Juan Perotti from uh, Buenos Aires put in the first endovascular stent in a human. And since that time, the use of endovascular repair has markedly increased. And as I mentioned in the beginning, at NYU, about 70% of all aneurysms, and that number just keeps going up, are treated with endovascular repair. This NCURE graft is no longer on the market. It was made by Guidant, and there was some um, reporting abnormalities, I, I should say. The company got sued. They weren't totally truthful in their, in their um, evaluation of potential complications related to this graft. You might also have heard recently that Guidant is up for sale, and Johnson & Johnson and Boston Scientific are competing to buy the company, so they're still doing all right. But in any event, we use this Anurex graft now, and there's a difference. The Anchor graft is a unibody graft, all right? It's just put in, and one limb is put into the left side and one into the right side, into the right common iliac artery. The Anurex is multi-component graft, and it allows much greater flexibility in using something like this as opposed to the unibody grafts. If you look at them on the radiograph or on the CT, you know, this is an anchorograph, excuse me, an anurex, totally supported with a metal framework throughout. And again, these are what are being used predominantly in the United States at this time. These grafts are put in generally just below the renal arteries, and they extend into both common iliac arteries just above the hypogastrics is a perfect, you know, way to do it. Occasionally, you have to put the distal attachment site into the external iliac artery if, in fact, you have an aneurysm of the common iliac artery or you're not going to get a good seal. It's just related to the intrinsic factors of the graft, that they just don't come with very large distal attachment sites, and they'll just be floating in the vessel if you don't get a good attachment. So why is endovascular repair being performed so, so much? Well, a study that was published in 2004 in the New England Journal of Medicine looked at the 30-day mortality of open versus endovascular repair. And as I mentioned to you, that 2,000 perioperative deaths were present in the uh, United States, at least in the past, because four points, almost 5% of people are going to die in 30 days if you do an open repair. That's a really large number. I don't think I would want to have that done myself. The 30-day mortality for endovascular repair in this large series, this is, was only 1.2%, so a big difference. <coughs> Yet interestingly, a more recent paper now in 2005, look at the two-year mortality of patients who were randomized into open versus endovascular repair. And at two years, the overall survival was not changed. In fact, for open repair, it was 89.6, and for endovascular, 89.7 percent of patients were, were alive after two years. The death rate, however, from aneurysm rupture, uh, uh, aneurysm-related death, was still much higher in the patients who were treated with open repair as opposed to endovascular repair. A number of, of concerns about a study like this, but, you know, I mean, it still goes to show that the aortic-related death is much higher after an open repair, but after two years, the death rate appears to be the same. And who knows what it's going to be like after four years. So this data is still being accumulated. Yes, sir? That's true, and the problem now is that the surgeons are, at least at my institution, I've noticed, are putting in endografts in just the opposite type of patients. Patients who are relatively healthy, you put in the endograft because it's not such a morbid procedure. So I think you, you're, you're correct in, in those early days that we used to be very careful about who we're going to put an endograft in. Nowadays, a lot more cavalier, I think, in who gets a graft. If you are doing evaluation of the aneurysm before placement of the graft, and we used to do this very tedious work trying to measure the exact size of the graft that needs to be placed in these aneurysms. And what I mean by tedious is we want to measure the diameter of the neck, right, because this is where your attachment site is going to be, so you want to have a good tight seal so you don't get a type 1 leak, that is a leak at the attachment site. 
You want to measure the length of the neck. Very short necks are associated with increased rate of leaks, that is, attachment site leaks. Angulated necks also. We measure this distance. I don't think it's necessarily that helpful, but our vascular surgeons and radiologists always wanted it. And of course, you want to measure from where you're putting the graft in to where the iliac bifurcation is, so you know the length of the graft. And of course, you want to do that on both sides because it's often different. When, when measuring the diameter of the neck or the aneurysm itself, it's very important to remember that the aorta is often very uh, ectatic. And it's not just the tube that's going straight down in the AP plane. So if we measure this as 50.1 millimeters in a true axial measurement, if we were to take a look at this on a coronal, we measure it like that 50.1, but the real diameter of the, of the aneurysm is this, 46.1. And the true orthogonal measurement is not often re obtained on an axial measurement. And so it's very important for you to keep that in mind when doing serial follow-ups. Did your colleague previously measure this on an axial image or a true orthogonal image? Now, I, I have to tell you that about a year ago, our vascular surgeons decided to send all of their data to this company known as MMS. It's up in, uh, in Dartmouth, I think, New Hampshire, where they actually do some incredible work. This is all they do, these 3D renderings and models for the placement of these endographs. They actually show the vascular surgeon what components should be used, how long they should be. Now, vascular surgeons claim they can't live without it. And then initially, honestly, I felt kind of hurt. I'm like, you know, I've been doing all this work for you, and now you're sending this data over there. But then I started thinking about it, that one of the things that I least liked doing was just measuring lengths of aneurysms. So, we don't lose anything. We still bill for the CT. The data is then networked up uh, via the internet. It's all HIPAA compliant, and then the surgeon gets this data back. And it's it's become very helpful to them, not only before but also after the management or after the placement of these endographs. So a lot of that work that we used to initially do in terms of placement of these graphs are no, is no longer done by us. And again, for me, that's fine. However, we still want to obtain high-quality data to get it over to the uh, to MMS, or if, if you can do it yourself, then fine. Four-row and 16-row scanners, again, I think you're using 1 to 1.5 millimeter thick sections, you're going to be fine. A pitch of 1.5, you can acquire the entire data set in a, in a breath hold, uh, obviously much quicker with a 16-row scanner. I want to mention one thing about radiation dose with a four-slice scanner versus a 16-slice scanner, there is a substantial amount of wasted radiation that does not contribute to the image when you use a four-slice scanner. In fact, this green, this dark green is, is marking radiation that does not contribute to the image. It's about 25 percent on a four-row scanner when you use the very thin sections. That wasted radiation is much less on a 16-slice scanner. So if I use the same protocol on a 4 or a 16-slice scanner, there's actually less radiation dose to the patient on a 16-slice scanner. However, if you use the very thin collimation on a 16-slice scanner, a 0.75 versus a 1.5, there's about 10 to 15 percent more radiation when you use the very thin sections versus the thin sections. So I think you should keep that in mind. Does every case absolutely need 0.75 millimeters? Does every case absolutely need to be looked at in 3D, as one of my colleagues had mentioned? I would say the answer is no. And the answer is no because you don't need to, but also there's increased radiation to the patient when you use those very thin sections. So you really got to think about radiation as well. This is just a diagram that compares a 4 versus a 16-slice scanner, and the amount of radiation is absolutely related to the collimation. So here if we use the uh, one point five detector configuration on the 16, you can see that the radiation dose is much higher than if you use the 0.75. So again, just it's about a 10 percent difference. Contrast administration, I think nobody uses an empiric delay now. Um, you can use a timing run, but the most efficient thing to, to do is to use bolus tracking. In bolus tracking, basically, you put a little cursor in the aorta at the level of the celiac artery. Your CT scan monitors the attenuation of that serially with a low-dose scan. At our institution, we trigger when the attenuation becomes 150 Hounsfield units. You have the patient breathe in, breathe out, take a deep breath in, and then you do your scan. And this is just an example of, like, basically, in the beginning of the scan, there's no increase in attenuation. Here at 15 seconds, 
it starts to go up, and then all of a sudden it rapidly goes up to 150. We start the examination. Well, actually, we breathe the patient. So the exam starts usually a few seconds after that, and your attenuation of the aorta is usually about 250 Hounsfield units. There are a number of different uh, techniques to decrease the amount of contrast that you use. We still use 125 to 150 mLs for all of our patients. We could probably get away with much less, especially if you're using a 64 slice scanner, but um, and certainly people do decrease the amount of iodinated contrast that's administered, which is very easy and reproducible, and you get excellent quality results in almost every case if you use a little bit larger volume of contrast. Sometimes you'll notice in the aneurysm sac some swirling. This is just due to a large amount of blood, unopacified blood, in the aneurysm sac. Obviously, you should not give positive oral contrast material. This is a patient who uh, had a pre-contrast and post-contrast scan. You'll notice in this patient, well, what do you notice here, anything? Well, look at the bell on the non-contrast and post-contrast exam. All of a sudden, there's high attenuation material in it. Here's that loop of bowel before contrast, and there it is after contrast. And obviously, this patient is leaking contrast into their bowel. And they call up the clinician, and sure enough, the patient has had obscure GI bleeding from some unknown reason. I can't tell you exactly where it is, but I'm sure this patient has a telangiectasia or angiodysplasia in there that just happened to be bleeding. By the way, um, it was commented on at a previous lecture that, you know, CT can detect very small amounts of bleeding in pigs uh, on the order of uh, several milliliters per minute. If you think about that, that's over a unit an hour. Okay, that's a lot of blood. That's not a little bit of blood. If somebody's bleeding that much blood, they probably shouldn't be on your CT scan. They should be in the angio unit or in surgery. Plus, regarding obscure GI bleeding, unless the patient is really actively bleeding at the time you do the exam, you're not going to see anything anyway. So just I, I think the role of CT for GI bleeding is not entirely uh, established, although, as in this case, you can see that there is bleeding into the bowel. Well, what, what do you need to look for? There's a couple of things that are important before the scan is done, and one of them is if you have an extremely heavily calcified vessel like this, it's very difficult to place these endographs. It's very difficult to get a good seal, and these patients are at increased risk for leaks. Both of these, the entire aorta is like a pipe, and here we have very heavily calcified iliacs. Not only is it difficult sometimes to get the grafts to seal on these patients, but trying to manipulate these rather large grafts up these very heavily calcified uh, iliac arteries can be rather difficult and almost impossible from time to time. Visualization uh, and evaluation for accessory renal arteries like this is important because if you put a stent graft in this patient, obviously the parenchyma to this uh, part of the kidney is going to be sacrificed. This is not a contraindication or an absolute contraindication to putting in an endovascular graft, but you have to realize that this patient is going to have a problem with ischemia afterwards. This patient actually did have a graft put in, but I'm just showing you the, the post-op examination showing, you know, ischemia to the lower pole of that left kidney. Evaluation for stenosis, I mean, how are you going to get an endovascular graft up something like this? It's impossible. When you have aneurysms like this in the common iliac arteries, you cannot get a good seal, so you have to put the graft into the external iliac artery. But that allows blood to back bleed into the common iliac artery, and you have continued perfusion of the aneurysm. And so if you're going to do this, you need to embolize the hypogastric arteries. And that's what was done in this patient. You can see the stent was put into the external iliac artery, and the hypogastric was embolized. These patients are potentially at increased risk, and they're at increased risk for a number of things, including uh, colonic ischemia, buttock claudication, and erectile dysfunction. A study from Germany showed of 54 patients that um, no colonic ischemia was present. But many of these patients who had internal iliac artery embolization did develop either buttock claudication or erectile dysfunction. Probably not the best things to have, but you'll often see well, you not often see, but this is something that you really have to look at after an aneurysm is repaired with either open or endovascular repair. It's interesting that it's not so common, but you look at this person that just had an open repair and now presents with GI bleeding. And colonic ischemia is absolutely what you have to be thinking about. Probably shouldn't even be doing a CT scan. They probably should go right to endoscopy to confirm that the bowel or the colon is ischemic. 
And this patient was then taken to the operating room, and you can see that the descending colon into the sigmoid was entirely gangrenous and dead. And it's a rare complication, but it can occur because you're generally sacrificing the IMA if it wasn't already sacrificed. But in particular, if you're going to also hit the hypogastric, sometimes you get embolizations. It's a complication that you need to be aware of. I mentioned to you the length of the neck is an important consideration because short necks over here, this is about a 7 or 8 millimeter neck, are at increased risk for developing attachment site links. As are necks that are very angulated like this, it's very difficult to get a stent graft around this angulation without contrast leaking into it. We did this case. Uh, I didn't think the patient was going to go for a graft as a result of that angulation, but they did a conventional angio. They decided, well, let's go ahead and Sure enough, before and then after placement, in this case of an ancure graft. And the patient's doing fine now, several years <laughs> after this graft was placed. <coughs> Something else you should always look for when evaluating these patients uh, is the presence of what you see here, duplicated IVC, or retroaortic or circumaortic renal veins, I think is very important. This is actually a case where the patient had an aneurysm. There may be an inflammatory component to it ventrally, but it wasn't commented on that the patient had a duplicated cava. This patient was uh, operated on by open repair, and the surgeon wasn't, wasn't aware that there was a duplicated cave and actually ran into some problems with that. So I look at those venous structures. It takes just, you know, I mean, it's, it's right there. While the operative mortality, you know, and other issues uh, related to being able to be transferred home sooner and, and morbidity after the procedure is much lower with endovascular than open repair, there are concerns, and this is what I want to spend the rest of this talk on, um, after endovascular repair. And these are lifelong concerns. And so every day we scan two or three uh, of these patients in our outpatient office, sometimes even more. A lot of people are getting these in, and they have to come in generally every six months to every year, depending on what you find. There's really acute complications and delayed complications. The acute complications, that is, that occur within the first few days or even few hours, arteriovenous fistulas, embolization of plaque material to the legs or to the kidneys. Endo leaks can occur acutely, obviously, and graft thrombosis. Delayed complications, you know, obviously, AV fistulas and pseudoaneurysms aren't uh, delayed complications. Those occur at the time of the initial procedure. But graft thrombosis, migration, and fistula, as well as leaks, are delayed complications. What we need to look for every time we evaluate these patients. Now, the group from uh, Montefiore published in 2003 that data should be acquired after endovascular repair with a non-contrast examination, an arterial phase, and a venous phase to optimize detection of endoleaks. Here you can see on the non-contrast, the arterial phase, the venous phase, there's a type 2 leak coming from a back bleeding IMA. Seen actually equally well in this case on the arterial and the venous phase acquisition. The problem with this technique is that the patient is getting three examinations every time they come. And if you look at the CT dose index, it's slightly higher for the arterial phase because we use our thinnest phase, our thinnest collimation for that data acquisition. So, but it's not like they're getting three exams. They're getting three exams every six months to every year. And granted, these patients are a little bit older, but I think it is a concern and something that we need to think about, and I'll come back to that in just a moment. Aortic stent graft leakage Endo leaks. There's really five different types. Type one are the attachment site leaks that occur usually acutely. These are usually not delayed leaks. You can have what's known as a type two leak, which is generally a retrograde filling of the aneurysm sac via the IMA or, or lumbar arteries in general. And these leaks are a little bit controversial. They occur in about 20% of patients. They really, in, in the majority of patients, are clinically insignificant as long as the aneurysm sac is not getting large or the leaks are relatively small. Type 3 leaks are really not uh, are, are something that we have to look for, especially with the uh, modular grafts where there's multiple components and you can have leaks from those different components. A type 4 leak is just a porosity through the graft and you see that on the initial angiogram but it's not really a concern afterwards. And a type 5 leak is endotension is when the aneurysm sac is measured to be getting bigger on follow-up examinations, and yet you cannot see that a leak is present. And these are troublesome, troubling, and we'll, we'll come back to those endotension leaks at the end. 
Type 1 leaks, I mean, this is after the stent graft is placed. You can see that there's contrast dorsal to the uh, graft. Sometimes on, just using axial images can be helpful, but I think you really need occasionally or, or usually to look at these on workstations to figure out exactly where the bleeding has come from because it's been shown that CT using a four slice scanner or a single slice scanner in axial images can have trouble identifying exactly the etiology of the leak. I think if you're using a 16 slice scanner and you have a nice workstation you can really uh, nicely show where the leak is. In this case you can see a regular, rather angulated neck and this is an attachment site leak coming right from the aorta bypassing this graft and going into the aneurysm sac and obviously the problem with this is that the aneurysm sac is still perfused and is still under pressure and so will continue to expand unless this is fixed. The patient actually also had an MRI and I mean on the, it shows the exact same thing. The patient ultimately had uh, a second extender graft put on here or embolization, embolization I forget in this particular <laughs> case. But I think that it, there was, I'm sorry, there was an article, I don't have the full reference here, that showed that, you know, CT may be inaccurate in localizing exactly where the leak is coming from. If you're using images like this, I think it's much better. In the vast majority of time, I think you can pinpoint where the leak is coming from. Again, if you have a short neck, there's really almost no neck in this aneurysm. I mean, it comes and then it kind of just balloons up, so you got to put the proximal part of the graft right underneath that renal artery and then the aneurysm occurs and these are people that are at risk for type 1 leaks and of course in this patient this is a sagittal image showing the attachment but then there's a leak right at that attachment site. So again a type 1 leak in this case uh, an angiogram was done it was treated with coil embolization. Now here's a patient who has swirling of contrast in the aneurysm sac so there's a leak in that aneurysm sac where is it coming from? In this patient, on the axial image, you'll notice the IMA is patent. And on the sagittal, you can see the IMA coming back and actually back bleeding right into the uh, aneurysm sac. So this is a type 2 leak. IMA leaks tend to be ventral, but they can swirl around in the aneurysm sac, as was done in this case. Posterior leaks, here's a little blush of contrast posteriorly, are usually from lumbar arteries, and you can actually see a little back bleeding lumbar in that case. Again, the significance of these type 2 leaks is in general related to the size of the aneurysm sac on subsequent examination and the size of the leak. In our experience, the vast majority of these leaks do not cause trouble. Here's a patient who has a small type 2 leak ventral in the aneurysm sac, likely due to a back, back bleeding IMA. Six months later, the thing is gone and the aneurysm sac is decreasing in size. Now if the sac size is increasing over time, then intervention is likely warranted. Another patient who has, here's your graft and here's a leak, again probably coming from the IMA, Six months later, which is how we followed this person, the leak was gone. You know, and these can spontaneously seal in the vast majority of cases. In fact, we look at the first 83 patients at our institution from 1999 who had stent grafts put in, and there was a total of 16 leaks in these 83, 16 type 2 leaks in these uh, 16 patients with 20 type 2 endo leaks. So about 20% of patients. Two of the aneurysm sacs was seen to increase in size over time where there was a leak. Those leaks were then embolized. But 14 patients with 16 leaks showed either a stable or decreasing aneurysm sac size over time. And these, uh, over time, spontaneously sealed in 62% of patients. And the other one, the aneurysm sac size has been stable, although the leak is still present. So I think that these can be safely followed and not intervened on. Sometimes it's not the easiest thing to embolize uh, these lesions. But that's why we follow them over time. It's important to remember that sometimes type 2 leaks you'll not see on the first exam, but can be delayed leaks, and you, you might see them on a second or third scan. So again, another reason that at least for the, for the present time, these patients need to be continuously followed. We do a uh, arterial phase. You see that small little density in the aneurysm sac. You see it on the venous phase, but you have to do a non-contrast scan because on the non-contrast scan, you see this small little density, and this is calcification in the aneurysm sac. It's not unusual for thrombus to calcify. So you absolutely need the non-contrast. It's been recommended that the arterial phase and venous phase are also necessary. But I, you know, in, in my experience, I don't think that's in, entirely true. Here's a patient with a large aneurysm sac. Here's the stent graft in there, the non-contrast exam. Here's the arterial phase image. All right, performed 25 seconds after the acquisition, after the, about 25 seconds. You can see that the two limbs of the graft are well enhanced. Do you see a leak? 
Let's look at the Venus phase. On the Venus phase, we now see this collection of contrast in the aneurysm sac, which I can pretty confidently follow back as a back bleeder from a lumbar artery into the aneurysm sac. And I have noticed from time to time that in the setting of a type 2 leak, sometimes because of the circulation time, getting contrast to go retrogradely around the SMA into the IMA or, or from the lumbars can take time, and you might not see these leaks on the arterial phase. And so the question then is, after the initial CT evaluation, where you do a three-phase to optimize detection of fistulas and, and pseudoaneurysms, do you really need to do an arterial phase as part of your, your evaluation? And the importance of that is that radiation. And I know that these per persons are generally older, but they're being put in in younger patients, and I think it's important as us as radiologists to consider doing the least amount of harm. And when I say harm, I don't mean to imply that CT is a harmful thing, but there is a lot of information out there that suggests that while the risk is low, it's not zero. And uh, this has been evidenced by a couple of things which I'll share with you in just a second here. Let's look at the radiation exposure of different types of examinations that one could obtain. Now, I go to see my dentist. It seems like every time I go to see him, he wants to get x-rays of my teeth. And they never show anything, and when he takes them, he winds up giving them to me and asks me what I think about them. <laughs> but, and, and honestly, I'm sitting there, and I'm a little bit concerned about the radiation. You know, it's my guy had a thyroid, I think, in there still. And, but, um, you know, if you look at it, it's actually a very low exposure. Okay, the effective dose is extremely low. You know, I can point out all these other things. Background in the city of New York is about 3.6 millisieverts. Abdominal CT, about 8 to 12 millisieverts. Now, we're doing a number of things to decrease that dose, but, you know, usually with multi-detector CT, you're talking about an 8 to 12 millisievert exposure with each examination. Radiation exposure in terms of other things, okay, across uh, country flight really isn't that bad. Abdominal CT, notice that atomic bomb survivors that live 2.3 kilometers from the epicenter of the bombs that were exploded in Hiroshima received 13 millisieverts of radiation on average. Okay, so I'm saying an abdominal CT has 8 to 12 millisieverts, and if we do a typical CT protocol after a stent graft is put in, you're really tripling that. And, of course, exposure is always cumulative. Is that 13 millisieverts risk for 2.3 kilometers from the epicenter of Hiroshima is significant. All right, well, believe it or not, over time, they actually looked at this data, okay? So they followed these people that were 2.3 kilometers, and they found that essentially those that were w within the range between 500 millisieverts but with a mean of 29 showed a statistically significant increased risk of solid organ cancers. It was small. But compared to a population that didn't receive that exposure, there was an increased risk. Another study looking at a mean of 20 millisieverts showed that there was an increased risk, but it was of marginal significance. That is, it did not reach statistical significance of a p-value of 0.05, and that included all patients and children as well. The bottom line is that I think that we need to recognize that while the risk of radiation is low, it is probably not zero. And the FDA now recognizes CT as a potential uh, teratogen. So, and, and this information is out there, and, and patients are often asked. And so I think it's important for us to consider in any examination, do you need to do four or five examinations of the kidney because the patient has a, a kidney lesion? The answer is no. I mean, you want to get diagnostic information for the most part. And exactly how you do that is something that I think is still uh, debatable. But you have to consider it in terms of the dose to the patient. Here's a patient on the arterial phase. Does anybody see a leak? Stent graft is put in. Here's the venous phase. Okay, now we see a small little blush of contrast that was back bleeding in from a lumbar artery, not seen on the arterial phase. Another patient, arterial phase imaging, status post stent graft placement. Does anybody see a leak? Venous phase. The whole aneurysm sac is filling with contrast. All right. So... Basically, I'm not going to go into this, but we just had a, a paper accepted into radiology. I think it's going to be a little bit controversial, but I'm glad they, they accepted it, uh, that in our experience, the arterial phase is not needed for follow-up of patients after stent graft placement. Probably going to come out in about five years knowing radiology, but, you know, by then we'll be doing some other technique. But uh, it, truthfully, in our experience, we looked at a large number of patients. The arterial phase did not contribute to the diagnosis of endoleaks in that if you saw it on the venous phase, you either didn't see it 
or you saw it on the arterial phase. In our experience, there was no case where a leak was seen only on the arterial phase, but not on the venous phase. And again, I mean, it's important because by eliminating that arterial phase, we eliminate 36% of the dose to the patient. Now, regarding dose, can we do other things to evaluate patient status post aneurysm? And the answer is absolutely yes. Here's a patient who has a stent graft in, cannot get a CT with chondrosis because he's got renal insufficiency. You can see this is February 5th, 2004. Guy's got a stent graft in. He's got a 69 or 60 or 70 millimeter aneurysm sac. You can see little blushes of contrast within the aneurysm sac. Here we are now four months later, June 2004. It's now 71 millimeters. Remember, before it was 69. And you see the contrast leaking into the... And, of course, the contrast conspicuity and the contrast resolution is much better on MR. And plus, you can do multiple acquisitions on MR. These graphs, these NUREX graphs, are safe in MR is also an important point. Now here we are. At the end of 2004, the thing is now 81 millimeters. So it's grown to 10 millimeters. And now, I don't know what the surgeons are waiting for in this patient, but uh, uh, April 2005 is now 86 millimeters. So it went from 69 to 86 millimeters at 17 millimeters. Some surgeons said to me, well, if this aneurysm sac were to rupture, still most of it, most of the blood will be bypassed. So the risk of death from rupture in a setting of a, a stent graft is probably not as great I'm like, yeah, but this thing is growing, you know, quite a bit. So they wound up taking this patient to the operating room, and interestingly, here's the psoas muscle, here's the aneurysm sac. What they found in this patient, they opened up the thing, they saw multiple back-bleeding lumbar arteries. Okay, and so what they did was they just sewed off every single one of those lumbar arteries and closed the thing back up and sent the patient back on. And we imaged him the other day, he looked all right. He wasn't feeling good, but he looked all right. What about ultrasound? There's been some experience with ultrasound uh, for evaluation of leaks. Here's a large graph. You can see the two limbs. There's this hypoechoic area in here. You put the color on in this thing, and there you see uh, blood flow within the aneurysm sac. All right, so there's a leak here. The question is, where is this leak coming from? If you look at this sagittal image, you'll see that uh, red is coming towards you. So you might think that maybe this leak is a type 3 leak that is an attachment site leak within the graft itself because the pulsation appears to be coming towards you. You would think that if it was a, a bleeder from the uh, IMA that it would be back. But if you look on the axial image, you can see it's kind of a yin-yang type of effect within that aneurysm sac. And the CT was done, and you can see, again, on the uh, arterial and venous. By the way, look at this, arterial and venous. Do you see it better on one or the other? Uh, clearly on the venous phase, but this is nowhere near the stent graft, it's right up against where the IMA is, and you can track this back into the IMA. So I think for localization of leaks, for detection of leaks, there's no question that CT is better than ultrasound. Here's a patient, though, type uh, non-contrast, arterial phase, venous phase. Anybody see anything here? This is an interesting case. Well, the non-contrast, you see the stent graft. On the arterial phase, I noticed there's some little wisps of contrast just ventral to the stent graft. And then on the venous phase, there appears to be more contrast within that aneurysm sac. If you look at a sagittal image of this, this is, again, the arterial phase and the venous phase. This is right up against the stent graft. It's nowhere near the IMA or nowhere near a back-bleeding lumbar, and I thought, could this be a type 3 leak? That is an attached, a, a, a component, you know, within this graft itself. Take a look at this graft with a 3D image. I mean, it looks like there's a separation of those component parts. This guy's 90 years old. The surgeon's like, well, you know what? It's a small leak. I'm just going to continue to follow it. But I think that this is really the first type 3 leak that I've diagnosed. They're relatively rare, but it's something to look for, especially if, if you look carefully you try to find out exactly where that leak is coming from. You would think that a type 3 leak would be more clinically relevant than a back-bleeding type 2 leak because it's coming right out of the pulsating aorta. Here's a patient... July 2003, stent graft in place, aneurysm sac measures 48.82 millimeters, no evidence for leak. No, I'm sorry, if you missed that, no evidence for leak. July 2004, so again, a year later, the thing is now 54.6, it was 48. So it's grown six millimeters in the year. And again, we don't demonstrate a leak, and an MRI was done on this guy for cholangitis or something. Uh, back in, in February of this year, and the thing is now 56 millimeters. 
So, you know, sometimes if you look at the two images, the two scans from one right next to the other, it's just like an oncology patient. You might not appreciate something, you know, here it's 54 to 56, uh, who cares? But here it was 56, started off uh, as 54, went to 56, 59. Okay, so it, it's grown quite a bit over that, over that period of time, yet we cannot see a leak. And so this is something known as endotension. That is, the aneurysm sac is getting bigger, but we cannot detect the leak. And it's unclear exactly why this happens. There's some theories, which I'll share with you. How is this treated? Okay, very interesting. What the surgeons thought maybe is happening with this guy, they did an angiogram, and they could not see a back bleeder into the aneurysm sac. And so it was thought that perhaps the reason why this sac is getting bigger was from transmitted pulsations, or perhaps leakage of contrast across the graft uh, the, the fabric of the graft itself. It's not clear to me how they came up with that. But what they wound up doing, they originally had an ancure graft in, they put an anurex within the ancure. So now the patient has two stent grafts in. Whether well, this is going to ultimately uh, rectify the problem that the patient has, but this appears to be a potential therapy for uh, endotension. The other thing that you could do would be to explant the graft and do the surgery. So again, endotension. You know, persistent pressurization of the aneurysm sac, but you cannot see an endo leak. And again, whether it's we're missing the endo leaks, and perhaps if we do an MR on these patients and do delayed images, we might be able to detect very slow leaks into the aneurysm sac, maybe a leak thrombosed or diffusion, as I, as I pointed out. But this appears to occur in about 3.7% of patients after graft placement. Now, I showed this in the last uh, lecture, but I think it's important to realize because it's a complication that's difficult we don't think about it, and especially if you're scrolling through data in axial images. June 4th, here is the anurex, the uh, ancure, the, the proximal attachment site. Here's the left renal artery. All right, it's not right up against it, but I think it's within, uh, you know, acceptable levels. The guy was having some, some pain. He came back five months later, and now you'll notice that the attachment site has migrated. Distal migration of these endografts occurs in about 3% of patients. Something that's not very easily visualized or noticed if you just do axial images. And I think it's important to just take a quick look at a coronal to see where that attachment site is. Because if this moves, you're going to lose your seal. And what's going to happen is you're going to repressure or you're going to reperfuse the aneurysm sac. In fact, I saw this. We call, it was an outpatient. We called up the surgeon. They brought the patient back to his, his office and he examined him, and the patient had this discoloration in the right flank, which is a gray Turner sign related to blood leaking out of the aneurysm sac because it had migrated down. The guy was presenting with acute pain. They took the guy to the operating room. There was fresh blood in the aneurysm sac. It had leaked out of the retroperitoneum, then out into the flank, accounting for that gray Turner sign. And this patient, they had to take out that stent graft, and they basically did an open uh, repair of the aneurysm. I mean, obviously, I think getting rid of that arterial phase is useful for follow-up, useful in the sense that you're going to decrease the amount of exposure to patients. But in the initial evaluation at the stent graft placement, you need to have um, the uh, arterial phase. Here we can see a small pseudoaneurysm at the location of the uh, puncture site. That's well visualized on this uh, angiogram. And, you know, this is another complication that we see from time to time. Everybody realize what this one is? Okay, so if we look at the right side, we see that the right common femoral vein is not opacified, yet the left common femoral vein is, and the 3D image just shows the inferior vena cava being filled from the left side, but there's no blood on the right side. So this is an AV fistula from the artery to the vein, and this kind of needs to be repaired. So these are some other things that I think you really need to do, those early phase images. Uh, graft thrombosis, again, I don't think you need an arterial phase to evaluate this, and this can be a delayed complication as well as an early complication. <clears throat> so in conclusion, aneurysms are common. Endovascular repair is becoming more and more common, while in the future we may not be called upon to uh, help so much in the measurement workup uh, early on. I think our expertise in looking for leaks and classifying leaks, looking for migration and other complications is very important. Um, and so to keep those things in mind that we talked about this afternoon. Thank you.